work out. One of the things that they came up with that really didn't work out in uh, the um, early 1800s was the um, uh, Bank of the U.S. or the, um, the basically a, a lending agency that the U.S. could use for itself. We ended up creating um, national debt with that. And um, a quote from Nicholas Biddle from about that time, the creator of this bank, actually said, no, no, the national debt is good. It will bring us together. Crazy ideas. Another crazy idea that didn't work out was in 1786, uh, Benjamin Franklin proposed some ch a change. And he said, in this change, what will happen, what should happen, is uh, we need to, during the spring, you probably know where I'm going, um, you need to um, uh, spring forward, you need to put your clock an hour forward, and this will help us conserve um, lighting. And then electricity was invented. He was trying to conserve lighting for lamps and oil and everything. And then electricity was invented, and for some reason, every year, we always say, we're gonna get rid of it this year, this is the year, and it never happens. <laughs> There's a lot of tired faces out there today. Um, as, a, as a parent of a one-year-old, I don't sleep, but it, I'm sure everybody else is tired. I'm always tired, but you know, I just got used to it. So, uh, good morning. Um, I uh, wanted to kind of switch gears with you just because I had a feeling we're kind of not all in the mood for a giant trip through Genesis today. So I figured I'd give uh, a message I've actually given before um, at another um, time, and I've kind of revised it over the years and stuff, but it's a lesson I'm constantly learning. Um, it's kind of a, the theme of the message is kind of um, when God turns your plan into his plan. You ever seen, um, you ever kind of uh, had, those, had those senses at those times when all of a sudden God um, takes your plan or just, you know, keeps going with your plan, but, but says, hey, I need you to do um, something over here. Um, one thing that just came to my mind immediately this morning when I thought of doing this message was actually, or last night when I thought of doing this message, was actually um, a scene from Indiana Jones. And it's the last Indiana Jones, and I don't mean the last one that has the alien in it, I don't, I don't view that as an Indiana Jones movie, sorry, but um, the one, um, uh, the last one that has Sean Connery in it, I forget the name of it now, oh, The Last Crusade. And uh, in the last crusade, there is a there's a moment in the movie where Indiana Jones uh, has been searching for the Holy Grail the entire movie, and he's reaching for the thing. The temple is crumbling around him, and his dad is there, and his dad says, "Indy, you gotta let it go." And you realize, as the viewer, there's no way for Indiana Jones to reach out and grab this uh, grail without himself falling to his death. And so you're going, come on, man, don't you get it? You've got to let it go. But the funny thing is, I don't ever take my own advice to Indiana Jones. Eventually he does let it go, and his dad finally uses his whole name and says, Indiana, let it go. His dad is trying to tell him, look, I understand that we have been searching for this thing our entire lives. And if you, uh, if you know the movie, his dad's even been searching for it his entire life. He's given up his entire life to search for this one object. And he understands the importance. There's other things. There's other things to do. Let it go. Let it go. And so as I was thinking about that, a verse automatically came to mind. And this is not the verse that I usually use when, when telling this, um, when talking about this. I want to talk to you about um, Mark 2. So if you go into your Bible to Mark 2, that's where we'll be. Mark 2. I love Mark. He's straight to the point. I love that he doesn't, he doesn't embellish. He just tells you how it is. I love, I love Mark for that reason. And so you'll find this um, in a couple other books. But Mark, in my opinion, is it's my favorite. The way that he tells this is my favorite. Um, at this point, uh, Jesus is kind of instating a few things. He's kind of telling us, first of all, how to take a break. So right before this, it talks about Jesus going to a solitary place. And um, the fact that uh, he's becoming such a rock star at this point, where he can no longer even enter a town. He has to, it says he remains in the lonely places on the outskirts of towns. Um, because uh, as soon, whenever he heals someone, he's constantly telling them, hey, um, yes, I have healed you, but don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody about that. And as a kid, I always was, was thinking, why wouldn't you want Jesus? Why wouldn't you want people to know that Jesus healed you? Well, because first of all, he's trying to push his death as far off as he can, so that he can accomplish his ministry on earth. But also because he, he also wants to avoid um, 
the rock star status as much as he can. Because he knows that when he starts giving stuff out, meaning healing people, that's not a bad thing. But all of a sudden, it will make people flock to you. That's why uh, in big tent revivals, um, that's, that's what made people flock to those big tent revivals. It wasn't worship of God. It was the promise of being healed from something. Um, the current generation that I teach... They are not aware of anything of Oprah Winfrey except one episode. You know what one, that one episode was? And you get a car, and you get a car, and you get it. That's, that's what they know Oprah Winfrey from, because she gave a bunch of stuff away. That's what a lot of people now in the current generations know Oprah Winfrey from, is that just giving free things. And that's what Jesus wanted to avoid. So before this, kind of leading up to this story, Jesus is being mobbed. Whenever he's trying to tell people something, he's constantly being mobbed by people wanting uh, their blessings, healings, uh, just to touch him. But the thing is with Jesus, he never rebukes anyone. He never says, eh, get back. In fact, his disciples try and do that for him. They do it to children one time, and Jesus says, no, 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 let, let them come. Let them come to me. And has an object lesson for that. Jesus never pushes anyone away. And that's a big object lesson to us. Because even when we're doing God's work, we can get in this mindset that we have an objective. And God knows the objective, and we need to stay on the objective. While that's good for avoiding distraction, sometimes it's bad because... Um, Sometimes there's some welcome distractions. Once I'm um, on a Mexico mission trip, and uh, if, you, if you forgot the story or don't know, um, I used to go to Mexico with the uh, Canby Christian group during spring break. There's a couple things we would do. We would build a church or uh, start building a church or do whatever they needed to on a church building that was being built. Uh, sometimes there were add-ons to a church. Sometimes it was a brand new facility. Um, but we would also have this time where we would go door to door and witness to people. And actually, it's different than you think in the U in the U.S. You're used to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons coming door to door and and uh, basically giving you something that says, "Hey, read this, and this will happen," and that kind of thing. Um, out there, it's a little bit different. Um, the only two kinds of people that come door to door are Christians and Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, and so people are actually kind of open to it. They like being prayed for, that kind of thing. They like to know that someone cares. And, um, you know, when you're in a part of Mexico where everybody's about yay tall, and, the, you know, a really tall white guy is walking with you, all of a sudden that begins to attract a crowd. And um, during these times, um, the thing that would happen a lot is that we had an agenda. We needed to go to a certain number of houses, or we needed to go around this block, and all of a sudden someone would do one of these, and we would be way over there or something like that, and me, someone that likes to be on a schedule, that would really bug me, and I had to get used to it. Well, the first time I went to Mexico, um, it was kind of our second to last day, and uh, I was unaware that they did this, but uh, Brandon Chase, who leads the Mexico mission trip, said, um, we're going to take a break from all our activities this morning. And I said, why? We're only here five days. Why are we taking a break? For four days, why are we taking a break? It takes us a few days to get down, a few days to get back. We're only in Mexico for four days. Why would we take a break? We need to keep going. We need to keep working, right? That's my American mindset. And he said, well, no. What we need to do is we need to stop, and we need to make omelets for people. Stop and make omelets. It didn't make any sense to me at all. I was, I was going crazy. Can, can we... Can we make omelets while still working, while still going door to door? And he said, no, everybody has to stop. We're all making omelets. So we all stopped, and we all made omelets. There were four burners out, and we started handing out omelets. And the craziest thing happened. All of a sudden, a crowd appears. And whenever there's food, whenever there's free food anywhere, it is true in every country, all of a sudden you will attract roughly 150 people. And that's what happened. The entire block was so full that you couldn't walk anywhere. There were kids and old and young and everybody and like dogs everywhere and one goat for some reason and chickens. And it was crazy. And um, all of a sudden, it just, all of a sudden our ministry got magnified because um, people were standing, talking together, not just the people that were working on the church or people that were um, with us, but other people. And people from the church, ladies and, and guys from the church, started walking around and talking to everybody and going, hey, if you like this, come back tonight. We're having an outreach. That was the biggest outreach we had so far at the end. Um, we, we must have had, you know, 85 people packed in a building about half this size. It was, it was insane. 
uh, because we decide to stop and make omelets. Sometimes you have to take care of people. Sometimes you have to care for people. Um, we made omelets all morning. I don't think we did any work that day. We didn't do any work on the churches. We didn't go door to door. We didn't pray for anybody. We didn't follow our trajectory. But it made our ministry all of a sudden that much more impactful later. Sometimes God wants you to stop and make omelets. Jesus is teaching. It says um, in Mark 2, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the words to them. So this is kind of a scene where we don't really know how big the building was. Um, we don't really know uh, how much of it was exposed to the open air. We don't know what they mean by a door, um, anything from a large door to um, a large entrance with just a drape over it or something like that. But what we know is that Jesus is in the middle and he's preaching to so many people that there's a line outside and people are crowded in and around to see him. And something crazy will happen. And no matter how many times I read this story, I'm always fascinated by this. <clears throat> Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. So these are four, four amazing friends, by the way. This guy is lucky. He has some, he, not lucky, but blessed. He has some amazing buddies. So amazing, in fact, they carry him up to the top of the roof and they start digging a hole through the roof. And I'm imagining Jesus standing there going, like picking stuff off of him, right? You're, you're speaking and things start falling on you. And, oh, <laughs> I'm sure he knew what was going on, but I'm imagining that he would have had a little bit of fun with it. Jesus, Jesus sometimes did that. When I, um, at one point earlier, uh, too, if you, you can read while I'm talking, um, uh, there's a man with leprosy that comes on up and he says, Jesus, please, if you are willing... Please heal me. And Jesus, it says Jesus was indignant. Um, I imagine him going, <laughs> okay. And then he says, I am willing. <laughs> Jesus likes to have a little bit of fun sometimes. So I, I imagine that he would have been. <laughs> anyway, this guy gets lowered down, and Jesus just it wastes no time. <clears throat> when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. I love that he didn't heal him right there. He didn't just say, get up. He could have done that. He could have, Jesus could have gone, oh, goodness, I have, I have something to say. I have a lot that I need to tell this crowd. I have a lot of teachings to lay on them. This was a grand return to Capernaum. I mean, it should have been, you know, it was already rock star status. He already had a line out the door. I need to speak the truth to these people. But instead, he decides to not just with a snap of his fingers, not just heal this guy, but actually to forgive his sins. That's the first thing he does. Now some of the teachers of the law in verse 6 were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out, full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Not only have we never seen anything like the authority that Jesus had over the human body, to, uh, to mend the human body completely and make this man stand up and walk and take his mat and just go home in full view of everybody. But we, have no, we had no idea that Jesus had the authority to forgive this man's sins. He saw into the minds of people that were ready to criticize him and with his authority alone can forgive all of it. Now that is something that we have never seen. Now we know a lot, we know a lot about the, 
the teachings of Jesus through the stuff that he did, right? We have um, so many, I mean, I could just keep reading. We have so many teachings about different things. Um, um, Jesus over the Sabbath, um, things that he's making new from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He, there's no shortage of teaching. So it's not like um, this always happens and it always just says, oh, Jesus was teaching and something happened. And then Jesus took some time and, and healed this person. We know so much about the teachings of Jesus that we a lot of times forget that um, that's not the only thing Jesus was trying to tell us. Jesus was trying to, was, was trying to model a witness life, not just tell us how to live, but show us how to live. So if Jesus was showing us how to live, and you are on a mission, and you see something that kind of takes you off of the path, a little bit of a detour, you get off the highway, you need to take it. Because you never know what's going to happen. Something else happened to me um, when I was uh, uh, at camp, um, doing some camp ministry. Like I talked about last week, I, I had another story from camp ministry. Um, in all these stories, I want to stress that I'm not the one really doing the ministry as much as Jesus is trying to tell me things about myself through ministry. And I believe that that's, that ministry kind of goes the two-way. If something goes way too smoothly and cleanly, I don't think you made an impact. Um, like if a VBS runs entirely without the wheels falling off at some point, it's not really a VBS, you know what I mean? Um, and kind of the same, the same being true if you're a teacher. If you're teaching something and you don't have somebody interrupting you going, wait a second, but then what about this? And you have to take some time to detour. Then what kind of lesson have you just taught? I don't got anything out of that. And that's, it's the same thing in ministry. So um, when we were doing camp ministry, at one point, uh, we were on the road. We had done so many ministries, actually, all at the same time that everybody was kind of worn out. It was, it was getting into mid-August. And uh, this is actually when Carrie Ann and I um, met up for coffee for the second time. Um, I was actually doing, uh, I was, I was uh, living in the basement or, uh, for like a week in this lady's house because that's where I was being housed while I was helping at this uh, church. Not only did we have one church in Beaverton that we were doing some ministry with, we had another church um, a little ways, a few miles away that we were actually doing more ministry with. So we actually were pulling, you know, 12, 14 hour days and things like that. It was, it was kind of wearing on everybody because everybody had been kind of, kind of tired all summer. And um, we finally get to uh, the second house we were going to live at, which um, we were all living together, all the people that were doing ministry together. We were living at this guy's house for a week who used to be a big game hunter and lead big game ex, uh, expeditions. So when we get into this house, all of a sudden I notice that he's got a trophy room. He really does. He had a trophy room with um, every, everything that he kind of had hunted at one point, but then it seems like the trophy room grew and enveloped the entire house. Like there was a big old warthog in the kitchen. Um, that they just hung stuff on. And uh, there were exotic animals. There were, you know, some normal animals you would find around, that kind of thing. But also some things where I went, you would have needed some serious, I don't know a lot, but you would have needed some serious uh, licensing to go after some things. And he, uh, we came in there, and he must have seen our the expressions on our faces. He got this kind of giddy look on his face. He went, you want me to tell you about my animals? And, and I kind of went, all right, yeah. We, we stayed up till till about 11 or 12 at night, even though we had to get up to, at 6 the next day and go um, uh, go do some more camp ministry. Because the first thing he did is he started showing us pictures. And this guy actually took people on expeditions up to Alaska. He's been to Africa multiple times. Um, it, just basically anywhere you could leave an expedition, this guy had, he had pictures from all of them. So he kept thumbing through and showing us all these. And then halfway through, he said, you guys want to see a split gun? <laughs> so we went out in the back, and he had a whole bunch of property behind his house, and um, of course set off a split gun a few times. But then, all of a sudden, a couple hours into the conversation, he said, um, uh, you guys probably didn't see me at church on Sunday, did you? And I, I didn't know. It was a big church. I didn't see anybody. But I was polite, and I said, no, we didn't, we didn't see you at church on Sunday. And he said, that's because I don't go to that church anymore conversation got a little big. All of a sudden, it took a detour from hunting all the way to the spirituality of this guy. And his wife and him sat down and said, look, we don't go to this church anymore because we don't believe that their faith matches up with ours. And it was about 11.30. I had the option of saying, well, that's interesting. Hey, we have to go to bed. But it didn't seem like the right, appropriate time. 
So I have to say, I didn't say this, but one of the girls that was um, also staying um, in like his, uh, they had a guest house too, they were staying at the, but anyway, um, she said, well, let's, um, let's talk about that. Why don't you want to go to church? Why, why, why is their faith different than yours? And he said, you know, I thought when we started going to this church, I, I really thought that we were Christians. And I thought that we believed uh, in God and that he was part of our lives, but that really wasn't the case. It was convenient. Um, when I went on all these hunting expeditions and things, that's what I worshipped. I went out and I, I worshipped making money, honestly, because he said I enjoyed going on these trips and meeting all these people, going to all these exotic locations and hunting all these exotic animals and making lots of money. And finally, when I had all that and I amassed all of it, I looked at it and I said, well, what do I want to do now? I guess I want to go do more of that, but I'm tired. It's time for me to retire. And he said, and I don't know my own, I don't know my God. I don't know what to, I don't know how to be a Christian. And he started talking to us about his faith, and we're all tearing up, going, wow, this is this is powerful. And someone had a Bible. I don't know who had a Bible, maybe it was actually uh, him that had a Bible. Someone started opening up a Bible and started sharing some verses with him. And some of our favorite verses, that we just said, well, here's some things that kind of let us know why we do what we do. And you know what? We didn't minister to this guy. We both, both, both groups got ministered to because we were tired, man. We were worn out from being on the road all summer. I was kind of wanting to get home. There was this cute girl I was dating. And uh, I kind of wanted to see her again. And it, it just didn't matter to me as much as it, it needed to, to reach the kids that we needed to reach. And... I had, some, I had a stinking mindset. And all of a sudden, I began to remind myself of what I believed. And he began to remind himself of what he believed in. Finally, at the end of the conversation, he said, what church do you go to? He's asking me. And I said, I, I go to kind of a non-denominational church. It's kind of whatever you want to do as long as your base is correct. And he said, wow, I never thought about it. Like, I thought I was, I didn't know I was a Christian. I thought I was a Lutheran. I always wanted to be a good Lutheran, you know? And I said, but what's a good Lutheran? And he went, I don't know. <laughs> but we talked about what it meant to be a man of God, and this guy went, you know what? That's what I need. That's what I want to be. And his, uh, he and his wife, um, they talked to us later and uh, actually passed a message to us when we got back to camp. Our camp director came up to us, Melissa, and she said, this guy wanted, he, he wanted to pass a message to you. He didn't have anyone's phone number. But he wanted to tell you that he and his wife found a church. All because we decided to make some omelets. We decided not to go to bed. We were very tired the next day. We decided not to go to bed early that night. We decided to listen to this guy's stories about big game hunting. And all of a sudden, God ministered to everybody. My takeaway this week, and something that I constantly keep coming back to, is um, when will I be in a situation where I'm seemingly doing God's work? I'm seemingly, I'm, I'm keyed in, I'm I think I'm listening to God, I'm doing exactly what he wants me to do, and then all of a sudden, a need comes up. Do I say, hold on, hold on, I'm doing something right now. Or do I simply begin to fill that need? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that your ministry wasn't about just telling us words. It wasn't about just speaking and um, teachings and how to live a, how to live a good life. If we if we had all that, we wouldn't even need a saving God. But I'm glad that you showed us by example how to live a life that follows you. And a life that follows you doesn't isn't something where you stand still. A life that follows you is something where you have to get up and go where the needs are. Let us listen.